can enjoy three sounds of the bell. Come back to our body, come back to our breathing. Enjoy being free from our thinking, our worries, our anxiety. Just enjoying our in-breath and our out-breath. Our out breath. Dear, dear respected Thai, dear uh, noble community, today is the 24th of March in the year 2021. We're still in the, the pandemic and we're studying the 40 tenets of Plum Village, teachings that Thai gave in 2000. Uh, 2006 and I think this is the first time we're streaming it live so welcome to everyone online <laughs> so this is a chance for us to go into the Dhamma together it is very exciting <laughs> it's like a cool uh, stream in the summertime when we're hot and all we can think about is the water and how cool it would be on our face and when we put our lips to the water maybe we put our head down into the water and we feel refreshed we can let go of any worry all the dirt on our body can <laughs> be carried away by the stream and that is uh, what it feels like to go into the Dhamma it's a uh, refreshing um, so the first is to come back to our breathing just be aware of the breath just wh whatever the position of our body whether we're sitting up whether we're lying down whether we're standing you can just be aware of our body this wonder of a body <laughs> It's uh, covered with skin and flesh and bone and full of all kinds of emotions, all kinds of ideas, concepts, filled with uh, millions of cells, human cells, bacterial cells. This, uh, wonder not only of our body but also of the air around us of the body of others the, the bodies of others of the earth beneath our feet I have this 
plastic table in front of me is also a wonder. <laughs> the thermos, the stone in the mountain, and the air that we breathe. This is all not philosophy, it's practice. It's the way of looking at uh, all conditioned things as a wonder, things that are impermanent and, and free from a separate self. So last class, we went into the first thesis. And for those of you, or the first tenet, So for those of you joining online, you um, might like to get a copy of the 40 tenets and follow along as we, as we go. I think it's available in a few places on the Plum Village websites, as well as uh, on the Order of Interbeing website in America. So I'll just briefly cover what we covered in, last, in the last class. So the first tenet is uh, space is not an unconditioned dharma. It manifests together. With time, matter. consciousness. And we talked about how space as an experience in our practice, we know that our body takes up space, and there's a space around us. And as we move around, there's the air, there's the resistance of the ground beneath our feet. But if you remove the ground, you remove the air, there's still space. There's a sense of distance, whether length or height, width, <laughs> three dimensions. And it is likely that uh, the monks, our ancestral teachers, and nuns that practice uh, getting in touch with space, they mm, had a practice of touching limitless space. And that sense of limitless space didn't include any um, thing you could touch or feel. And in that sense, they thought of it as being unconditioned in the way that nirvana is unconditioned. But if we look more deeply at space, we see that it is, uh, first, first of all, a notion. So it is something that we create with the human mind. We, we by this awareness of something depth, deep in front of us, to our side, above and below, a sense that things are not all occupying one uh, singularity, <laughs> as it were, but they are spread out in three dimensions. That is an idea. Uh, space 
as a, as a way to describe our, our lived experience of moving within three dimensions. And so in that sense, space is conditioned. It's conditioned by our thinking. It's a concept. But even if we look more deeply, we see even uh, if we try to ascribe a physical basis to that notion and say, no, but there's something that is space, we see that that, even in the scientific way of looking at space, we also have come to see it as something conditioned. Uh, through the theory of relativity, we know that uh, space can be affected by mass, by matter. If there is a very massive body, even re relatively uh, low mass bodies have some effect on the curvature of space. So when light comes from far away uh, stars, we can actually measure how when they pass by massive stars on the way, the ray of light from that star is, is curved. And so there's actually a curvature of space-time. And that is, a, that is a, also showing that space is conditioned. So even in the way that we scientifically understand space, we try to get beyond the notion of space, even that what we ascribe to be space is conditioned. It's conditioned on matter. It is not something that is unconditioned. And when we look deeply into space, we see that it is also made up of time. And time is also conditioned. <laughs> it is not something unconditional. Our time, our sense of time, is also a notion. Actually, we only have this present moment. But we use the word present moment to distinguish between what will happen after this moment, the future, and what has happened before, the past. <laughs> but the past is only our memory of experiences that we have uh, before this present moment, but that have left a mark on our consciousness somehow, in the form of a sign, or a feeling, or a memory. And so, actually, we just have this present moment. But we talk about the past based on this lived experience, that there is some kind of continuity in this body. There are feelings, there are perceptions, there are mental formations, and I recognize some kind of pattern in that. And so that gives me a sense that there is a continuity between what has happened before and this present moment, and then my anticipation of what will happen after this present moment is also experienced in the present moment, but that is uh, only uh, the planning or thinking forward aspect of my mind, and I call that the future. But everything is experienced only right here and right now. <laughs> so actually, we see that time itself is a conditioned concept, it's a notion. And there is no, uh, we can use uh, the movement of, for example, uh, the clock hands in, around the clock, uh, or the dripping of sand through a, an hourglass to give us a sense that time is passing. But those are all just uh, conditioned things that are representing uh, uh, an idea of what we more accurately refer to as impermanence.
So in terms of freeing ourselves from our suffering, we find it more helpful to talk about impermanence than to talk about time. We tend to quantify time, right? We put numbers on it and we say that uh, the movement of large bodies, like the rotation of the earth, half of the time in shade, roughly half of the time in shade, half of the time in the sun, wherever you are on the earth, that that is one day. And then how long it takes for the, the earth to rotate in its orbit, all, or sorry, to move in its orbit all the way around the sun, that is one year. And then we subdivide the day into hours and minutes and seconds and milliseconds. And, <laughs> and even now we have an atomic clock that is based on the decay of, the radioactive decay of, of atoms to determine, the, some, to try to get at some kind of regular understanding of time. But ultimately, it's still conditioned. All of these ways of measuring, ways of thinking about time are conditioned. And conditioned things are impermanent. That means they're subject to change. So they're subject to arising, manifesting, they're subject to abiding for a time, and then passing away. And so rather than concentrating on time, as, as a scientist might do in their ob observational study, we, as practitioners, as scientists of the, the first person <laughs> of our own practice looking inside, we practice concentrating on the impermanent nature of things. So we don't need to measure the rate of impermanence, but rather to recognize it. It's a realization to see that this body, our body is always changing. We're growing older. Our senses are perhaps, uh, if we're very young, they're developing. And then as we get older, they become <laughs> less uh, able to see, to hear, to, uh, to speak. Um, And so recognizing that is actually a freedom. So that's why this uh, statement, we can see it as a practice, to say that space is not an unconditioned dharma. It means that space is also conditioned. Space is also subject to impermanence. And when we talk about impermanence in terms of space, we use The, ter the term um, non-self or empty of a separate self. So looked from the aspect of time, we see impermanence. Looking from the aspect of space, we see non-self. It means that there's no, there's no essence, there's no separate entity that you can, that is cut off or somehow removed from everything else in the universe. So we, our teacher used the term interbeing. We cannot be by ourselves alone. So one way is to say non-self, so there's no in, uh, self, there's no uh, thing inside of me which is somehow uh, free from uh, interacting with something in you. <laughs> it, it, there's nothing that is cut off from the rest of reality, but actually we inter-are. There is uh, uh, constant communication through eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, through the pores of our skin, through the very flesh of our body that is the continuation of our ancestors, that has come from the earth, has come from the atmosphere, has come from the sun. So all those things are interpenetrating us at all moments, and we cannot 
see any part of this body, these feelings, our perceptions, our mental formations, our consciousness, anything that is outside of that. And seeing that is called wondrous existence. <laughs> it's a wonder. <laughs> it's a kind of bliss because we no longer feel alone. We, know, we don't feel isolated no matter where we are. Even if we don't see another human being for many months, we are living in a mountain and we feel with this way of looking at space and time, we feel completely connected. And if we are living with lots of people in a very tight space, and people are not practicing mindfulness, people are not uh, <laughs> very, perhaps, kind, we can still touch using the concentration of impermanence and non-self we can still touch this nature of interbeing. We can see that there's, there's nothing that is uh, cut off from the rest of reality. Everything interpenetrates. So this is uh, how to practice with this tenet. How I like to practice with it. We see that space is also empty of a separate self. It is not an unconditioned dhamma. And it manifests together with time, impermanence, matter. When we look into matter, we see that it is impermanent. Everything is always changing, even if it's a very, 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 at a very slow rate. Some subatomic particles are decaying at the rates of billions of years, but they are ultimately impermanent. So matter has this quality. When we look at matter, we can see in it the aspect of impermanence. And we can also see the aspect of non-self. From the point of view of time, matter is impermanent. From the point of view of space, it is non-self. It interpenetrates with everything in the universe. It inter-is with everything. And consciousness as well. In the, the Buddhist tradition, we, we talk about consciousness as having aspect of mind consciousness it means what's there in the present moment in our mind if uh, joy is manifesting then joy is in our mind consciousness we are aware of the joy if we are thinking about a math problem, that is what is in our mind consciousness. You can think of a computer and what is on the screen in that moment. You know that inside the hard drive of that computer there is a lot of data. And if you try to represent that data on the screen at the same time, it would look like a bunch of static. You couldn't, you couldn't comprehend anything. So you only bring up at that moment what you want to look at. So that is your mind consciousness. So at this moment, maybe none of us is angry, or none of us is afraid. But that doesn't mean we believe that we don't have the seed of anger in our consciousness somehow, or that we don't have the seed of uh, fear in our consciousness, or the seed of joy. Somehow it's there, but it hasn't yet manifested or it's not manifesting at that moment. It's not present in mind consciousness. So we can talk about a kind of store consciousness. And in that store consciousness, there are the seeds of mindfulness, 
concentration of anger. They can have different shapes, joy. <laughs> and a good practitioner knows how to touch the seed of mindfulness in the store consciousness so that it can manifest as mindfulness in mind consciousness. So it, we can find ways to, to to water the seed of mindfulness so that when the seed of anger is also manifesting, something we perceive brings up the, the flower of anger because it's like a flower in our mind consciousness. And as a practitioner, we know to, in that moment, I'm angry. So it's, we recognize there's anger and then touch the seed of mindfulness to bring it up. And maybe that anger doesn't go away, but it, it's like you shine a light on it and understand better its uh, roots. What have I said in the past? What kind of uh, maybe conversations I've consumed, my family life, movies, music, things that I've said or done to my friends that have watered that seed of anger. Things that I've heard, things that have been done to me, said to me in the past that has made that seed strong enough that now with one word or one phrase, the anger manifests in mind consciousness. And so when we are a practitioner, we know how to invite mindfulness up to embrace the seed of anger. And we, we often talk about uh, consciousness like points of light that are, um, it's like if we hold a candle and we move it around in a circle and then we take individual snapshots of each moment we would just see one point of light of the candle. But if we leave the, the camera shutter open for maybe a second or two or three seconds so that and move our arm in a circle, and when we expose the film, we will see a continuous circle. So consciousness has that nature. It is a, uh, it has a nature of being um, like points in each instant but we experience it as a continuity. It is like our, our, the shutter on our camera is kept open. And so all these firings of neurons, all of these uh, moments of feelings, perceptions that happen in, in moments, all of the, con the consciousness of our eye, what we see here, although they are, you could break them down into tiny slivers of instance, but the experience of it is, a, is continuous. And so what we call consciousness is actually this continuous experience of instance going on, of instance in impermanence. And so consciousness is also impermanent. And it has a non-self nature. And most of our training as practitioners is to realize that that's what I try to do most of my day. <laughs> because when emotions manifest, they have that familiar look, feel inside my consciousness. And I think that anger is me, that sadness is me, and that joy is me. And as a practitioner, I know as long as I hold on to that idea, then I will suffer. <laughs> because actually the anger is just anger. It's not mine. <laughs> it's just when conditions are sufficient, then anger manifests. And so with mindfulness, I see it as a phenomena 
a phenomenon. Anger is a phenomenon manifesting in mind consciousness. It's not something that's me, myself, or mine. <laughs> so it's uh, very fun to practice, to let go of our idea of ourself. And here we start with letting go of the idea that space is um, free of conditioning, as well as time, as well as matter and consciousness. They are, they are interdependent. Without matter, we can't have consciousness. Consciousness depends on... I mean, consciousness is always consciousness of something. It cannot arise without uh, an object. So we have the eye in contact with forms. So when I look at the thermos, my eye comes in contact with the light that's bouncing off of the outside of the thermos, goes into my retina, and then stimulates neurons in my brain. And somehow, along a pathway, I associate with that with the word thermos, because I've learned the word thermos. Because there's a company that makes these hot water bottles that's called thermos. And so if I say that, then that has meaning for other people. But the, the, the distance that has gone from these light photons bouncing off of the outside of the thermos into my eye and my retina, if we slow it down, this incredibly complex series of steps that are going on there. So clearly, uh, matter is part of the process. Space is also part of the process. The photons are moving in space. Time, right? The photons moving at the speed of light and then the time my neurons firing in my brain to, to register the form of the thermos in my consciousness. And so that is, all those consciousnesses dependent on all those things. So that's just a brief <laughs> summary of what we learned last time. So I'd like to go into the, the second tenet. In the historical dimension, every Dhamma is a conditioned Dhamma. In the ultimate dimension, every dhamma is a 
and unconditioned Dharma. The unconditioned is the ground of all dhammas. So Thai, uh, so there's a um, phrase Thai use, which is the dialectics of the Dharma. Everything that we learn is to help us to be able to let go of our learning. Every concept or word that the Buddha teaches us is to help us to let go of our attachment to words and concepts. And if you understand that point, then the Dharma becomes very easy. <laughs> but so long as you are looking for some kind of absolute truth in the words, so long as you are looking for some kind of absolute truth in concepts or ideas, then you will suffer. Because you're, su you're, you're trying to uh, grasp onto something which cannot be grasped onto. You're trying to use signs or representations to try to represent or be a sign or signal something that cannot be signaled or represented. <laughs> and so nirvana is the unconditioned. So it's something beyond description, something we cannot grasp onto or hold onto, something that is present in every cell of our body and every atom and every part of the nature of reality. You can touch the unconditioned, but the problem is that we, in our yearning for the unconditioned, the yearning for freedom, we tend to grasp on to concepts or ideas. So right away in the second tenet, Tai already brings to light this um, these uh, dialectics, dialectics of the Dhamma, which help us to free our, it's using words, using concepts, to free ourselves from words and concepts. <laughs> so first we learn that space is not an unconditioned Dhamma. It manifests together with time, matter, and consciousness. But then we see in the historical dimension, every Dhamma is a conditioned Dhamma. So, we talk about the historical dimension and the ultimate dimension. So the historical dimension is are things um, that happen according to impermanence, according to uh, coming and going, uh, being born and dying, being and non-being. So we look at the flower and we say, well, the flower is there, but we know that the flower one day will no longer be there. Be there. And we know that before the flower was there, there was only a seed in the soil. And we look at the seed and we say, there's no flower. That is an idea of non-being. So the flower is not there. And then with some water and sunlight and the right soil and the right temperature, then the seed manifests. And soon we have a small plant, a 
and then the beautiful orchid flower manifests. And we say, now the flower is there. It is. Before it was not. Now it is. And then sometime in the future it will decay and we say, oh, it's not there anymore. It, it's gone from being back to non-being. So that is a way of thinking of things in the historical dimension. That there are things that are not there. They are not non-being. They come into being and then they go back to non-being. <laughs> but with a, a deeper look with more mindfulness, we can look into the flower and see that actually the seed is still there in the flower because all the conditions, many of the conditions necessary to manifest the flower are already there in the seed. The DNA, the uh, capacity to break open with the right amount of humidity, the right amount of temperature, all those things are already there in the seed. So the flower is actually already there. So when we look with the ultimate, the eyes of the ultimate, we can see that things are already connected. Yeah. So we become free of ideas of being and non-being. But we see that when conditions are sufficient, phenomena manifest. And when they are no longer sufficient, then they cease to manifest. They haven't gone from being into non-being. But actually, it's only, that's only looking at a very superficial level of things. So in our practice, we, we are training to, though we live in the historical dimension, we train ourselves to be able to touch the ultimate dimension, where there, is, there are no longer concepts of being and non-being, coming and going, same or different. So in the historical dimension, we have birth and death. We, have, we know that this body has been born of a mother and a father, and that it will grow old, get sick, and die. And that is all very normal, right? <laughs> so those are things that are, that are happening all around us. The, phenomena that we experience through our eyes and ears and so forth. So everything that we experience or perceive is in the historical dimension. When we grasp at it from the sense of representation, when we have a concept or notion, that is all in, happening in the historical dimension. So even the word nirvana or the unconditioned is taking place in the historical dimension. So the practice is then, how can we touch the ultimate dimension in the midst of the historical dimension? And so Tai uh, would teach us to look into, for example, the concept of God in the, in the Christian tradition or in the, the Abrahamic religions. And for many theologians, there's something very close to um, the unconditioned in God, when we see God in all things, that it is the, the ground of all being. That is coming very close. But sometimes there's still that attachment to separating the Creator from the created. So as uh, human beings, we are the created in the, in the theology of uh, Christianity. And God is the creator. And God the creator is somehow separate. We cannot say that God is the creator, is in the created. He is somehow other than the created. And that leads to dualistic thinking. So we separate the creator and the created. <laughs> so in Buddhism, we look at it from a slightly different point of view. So we say that uh, 
instead of talking about the created, we talk about the historical dimension. So things that are happening at the realm of being and non-being, coming and going, same or different, more or less, increasing, decreasing, all these uh, ways of differentiating between one thing and the other thing. So in the, in the historical dimension, there is a tendency to measure, to separate one thing that has qualities that are different from another thing, and not to see the, the interbeing nature that is there, it, that can be touched when we look more deeply, when we go down from the surface level. So in the historical dimension, every dhamma is a conditioned dhamma. Anything that can be said to be in the historical dimension is conditioned. And in the ultimate dimension, so beyond any concept or notion, Every Dhamma is an unconditioned Dhamma. Even space, which we just said is an, not an unconditioned Dhamma. <laughs> so it seemed like there's a contradiction there. How can we say space is not an unconditioned Dhamma? But then here we say in the ultimate dimension, every Dhamma is an unconditioned Dhamma, including space, time, matter, and consciousness. And the point is that this is not about philosophy, but it's about practice. So we practice in the historical dimension to look into every cell in our body, to our breathing, to our, um, even our ideas and notions, to see that there is the element of the unconditioned in the condition. So all dhammas, when we talk about dhamma, it means a phenomena, um, like the cup of water, or a cloud, or a thought, or my anger, even time, space, any kind of concept, anything we can attach a notion or have a perception about is a dhamma. And if we, for example, if we just see ourselves as the created and we cannot see the creator, <laughs> if we just see ourselves as somehow separate from God, then we will be very lonely. <laughs> we will feel that uh, oh, we are worthless because we, we don't have that God nature in us. So that is why we, rather than talking about God or Creator, we talk about the unconditioned. So what cannot be expressed, what cannot be um, perceived by any quality of like flavor, color, scent, <laughs> pattern. So in Buddhism, that is a, a skillful means. We use this put these uh, dialectics of the Dhamma to help free ourselves. To see, ah, oh, you touch something, it brings you joy, brings you happiness, brings you freedom. But then you try to hold on to it. You say, what is that thing? You say, that is an unconditioned Dhamma. That is Nirvana. <laughs> and then right away you already lose because actually it's become conditioned. You have uh, put a quality on the unconditioned. You have given it a flavor or a concept, a thought, some kind of tone, and it is no longer unconditioned. It is something conditioned. It is just a designation. And so, as a practitioner, we let go of that idea again, and we say, no, I, I want to touch the unconditioned. It's not uh, enough to just grasp onto this body or these feelings or these perceptions this consciousness. I want to be really free. And so we train ourselves to let go of the condition. Let go. Just keep letting go. <laughs> so in the 16 steps of mindful breathing, we're invited to see the impermanent nature of all things. 
and that helps us to let go of our desire, our craving for um, any sense pleasures. And then that calms our mind. So our mind ceases to become agitated, ceases to have ideas of being and non-being, coming and going, same or different. And then we let go. <laughs> we practice letting go. The 16th step of the, the mindfulness of breathing, sutra. That is the practice of touching the unconditioned continuously letting go, continuously. <laughs> Maybe we can listen to the sound of the bell. Right now there is a volcano erupting in Iceland and some scientists put a, a camera on that volcano and attached it to the internet. And so the past few days that's been my meditation. I have a computer screen uh, in the, well, we have in the office a computer screen with that uh, live video of the volcano erupting with the, the lava coming up and out and pouring down the sides and then going out into the plain in uh, molten rock. And I also have a, a screen in my room and I just put it there and I've been using it as a meditation <laughs> to watch this live uh, volcano erupting. And I, I was reflecting on why do I find it so pleasant to watch this volcano erupting? <laughs> Sometimes there are helicopters that are flying over it. Sometimes there's a scientist who comes by and waves to the camera. <laughs> and I looked, I looked on, on, the, on YouTube and where they have the live stream. And this, today there was something like 16,000 people watching this volcano erupting. And so I reflected on what makes it so interesting to watch this. And I thought, wow, there's something to do with impermanence. And I practiced to look at that, uh, that uh, red hot r molten rock coming out of the, the, the volcano as my body. There are some elements, perhaps, of the ancestors that are there in, in that rock. And I know in my, my very body, the elements of the earth are there. And seeing that, the earth recreating itself from below, the, through heat, pushing up through pressure, up and out onto the surface, and then out, creating new earth on top of the old earth. I have some, some kind of joy. It's just a... It, it, I really see that uh, this life force, this heat that we carry from generation to generation, unbroken for millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years, through, from our mother's womb, that heat she gave to us and then passed on to us, which we then carry in, in us and may go on to our offspring. That is also the heat coming from the earth now we know that uh, it's very likely that uh, the bacteria that are our ancestors are formed probably from mm, vents with uh, heated water, like geysers, like at Yellowstone, coming up out of the earth, and the bacteria that can live there uh, form the lipids that made the, form, the first uh, membrane, I'm sorry, the, the chemicals that were there through the heat of the, the earth pushing up through the geyser, 
then led to the lipids, which formed the membranes of the first uh, bacteria, the first cells. So I reflected on all that watching the, as I watched the volcano erupting and just get in touch with the, this uh, process which is going on in the historical dimension. See if I can touch the ultimate, look more deeply into it and see that that molten rock is not separate from me. I, I can touch it in the life force in my body. I can see a deep connection. We are not, uh, we are not separate. Even though I, I don't want to go near that <laughs> molten rock, and I have, you know, I've been one time on an active volcano in Indonesia, and yeah, there's a little bit of fear looking down into the, <laughs> into the caldera, seeing the, the heat coming up. It's, a, it's not a very pleasant place for human beings, but somehow there's this fascination because it's like I'm looking into the heat of the life force that is supporting my very own body. Going back hundreds of millions of years is, is so wonderful. <laughs> so that was my meditation of practicing to go from the historical dimension into the ultimate. And we can do it with anything, not just the, <laughs> the live stream of a volcano. We can do it with the water that we drink teacher like to look into a glass of water and see the cloud. So if it's, uh, if we are only staying in the historical dimension, we just have a glass of water and the water is liquid and uh, it's moving around and then as we drink it, it goes into our body. But with the eyes of interbeing, we can see that this water is already our nature. We are mostly made up of water. And the water in this cup was in a cloud. And the cloud then became rain that fell on the earth that eventually seeped into the soil and became the, a, sp a spring and uh, eventually made its way to my thermos. And now it goes in my body, and then eventually I will urinate it out, <laughs> or sweat it out, and it will go back into become a cloud. And so that whole process, by looking deeply with the eyes of interbeing, we see that the cloud is still there in the water, and the rain is still there. And the, that means now the cloud is in my body and it goes back to being a cloud. And that is the eyes of no birth and no death. So that is touching the ultimate. So we can say in the ultimate dimension, we see things as having the nature of no birth, no death, no coming, no going, because we see that there's nothing lost. There's nothing that goes from being into non-being. We don't we not, we are, it's not like we are, are right now and that we will in the future no longer be. But we are just part of a process of uh, since beginningless time of manifestation. And so I often called it like a game of hide and go seek. At this moment I manifest and we don't know the next moment if conditions will still be sufficient for this body, these feelings, these perceptions to manifest. And that is the nature of things. And then we don't feel afraid anymore. We don't fear death. We don't fear getting old because we see that's just the nature of the body. That's the nature of our feelings and perceptions. It's very joyful. <laughs> and so we can ride the waves of birth and death without fear. That is a touching the ultimate dimension living in impermanence, seeing the nature of non-self without fear, without grasping. And it's a, it's a practice. It's not a, for the sake of describing reality. It's a, something we actually do. 
So that's what I take as my practice in my meditation. I sit down and I breathe in and out and I, like, I notice all this thinking coming up from my projects, whatever conversations I might have had, some interactions I might have had. And I see that these feelings are not me, these perceptions are not me. They are phenomena that manifest due to causes and conditions. Things that I said in the past, things that I've done, um, they are all part of a process, but I don't need to grasp onto them. So long as I grasp onto them, then I, I have difficulty to see the root, what is really going down, what is really going on down there in the roots of my consciousness. So when we, touching the ultimate is something we can do with any Dhamma. And when we do that, then we see the unconditioned nature of the Dhamma. So even these, everything that we experience in the historical dimension, which is coming and going and being and non-being and flowers and trees and spring and bees and breath and body and blood and feelings and everything we experience is all of it has this unconditioned nature. And that is not something that is uh, separate from its conditioned nature, but it is inherent in all things. And that is the, the practice, to, to touch that, to become free from our conditioning. For example, you may like vanilla ice cream. Who here likes ice cream? Only one? <laughs> two. Okay, almost everyone likes ice cream. And then you have a flavor that you like, so every time you go and you go, oh, I, I like vanilla ice cream or I would like pistachio. And that is a conditioned thought. You think, I am someone who likes pistachio, I am someone who likes vanilla. And then, it, it's such a pity, because there are so many wonderful flavors that you can try. If you just let go of grasping of your favorite flavor of ice cream, then you can taste pistachio, you can taste the mango sher uh, sherbet, you can <laughs> sorbet. You can try all kinds of different flavors. So in the same way, when we touch the unconditioned, then suddenly all kinds of new possibilities open up, new wondrous things. And those wondrous things are then not new things that we start to grasp onto, but we as practitioners train ourselves to know that we just experience it. We just enjoy the wondrous nature of things without grasping at it without getting attached. That is the core of the practice. You don't need to make concepts and ideas and then believe them to be really real. Is, that, is the, that is it. That is the nature of the practice. So these, these, these statements of Thai, I see them really as inviting us always to practice. They're not statements for the purpose of describing reality or some kind of ontology. And the unconditioned is the ground of all dhammas. It is there in, in all things. But it cannot be described, it cannot be touched, it cannot, I mean, it cannot be physically contacted. But we can touch the unconditioned. There is a way to do it by freeing ourselves from grasping at the condition. So this statement also is not a statement of theology or ontology, but it, it is a practice. It's to, we practice to see, because our normal, habitual way of doing things is to see, oh gosh, you know, breakfast with the brothers again in Solidity Hamlet. <laughs> Everyone's like mm, looking at their bowl of cereal and kind of mm, moping around. And, and it just feels like, oh gosh, this has happened like this hundreds of times already. It's the same food, same oatmeal, same bread, same peanut butter and almond butter and olive oil or whatever. We, we have very good food, but still it gets boring. You think, oh, it's just the same every day. But when I notice that in, my, in me, then I try to see, well, but what if I looked at it with new eyes? 
I said, wow, like the f I remember the first day I came back to Deer Park a couple of years ago after being away for 10 years, and I think, wow, look at all the wondrous food for breakfast. It's amazing. Fresh fruit. We're in California. Uh, like really tasty oatmeal. Brother Min Yung makes granola. Wow, it's amazing. Like, look at all this wondrous food. But how did it happen that over days and days, many months, then I just come down and, oh, the same food. It's because I, 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 I lost my capacity to touch the ultimate in the very everyday, normal, wondrous phenomena that are going on at the breakfast table. And so that is uh, how, by cultivating this beginner's mind, this kind of openness of just always coming back to the breath, always coming back to the body, coming back to our, our habits, our anxiety, our worry, and looking at them with new eyes. Now in the study of uh, emotional psychology, they are abandoning classical ideas of emotions, saying that, for example, anger is the same exact thing that manifests, that's hardwired into you as it is to me. I might experience anger in a very different way than you might experience it. And what I've even noticed since getting that insight is when I look at my anger, it's always looking, it's always manifesting in new ways. I cannot say that it's the same anger as yesterday or the day before. But I'm experiencing new things, new conditions, new qualities based on my experiences and how that anger is manifesting. And so I look at it with, with mindfulness, with the eyes of joy, and say, wow, my anger, you are there. You are manifesting in a new way. How is it that I can learn so that you don't overwhelm me, so you don't take over my mind? Because I don't want to be angry. <laughs> I want to be happy, but I know that I need to see the unconditioned nature in you, anger, if I want to be free from you. And that is, a, that is a, the insight of a practitioner. And that's what I try to do in my, my daily practice and how I try to practice this uh, second tenet. Moving from the historical dimension, where every Dhamma is a conditioned Dhamma, and to the ultimate dimension. It is changing our way of looking. It's not changing reality. It's just changing our way of viewing things, freeing ourselves from concepts and notions. That's the essence. And the unconditioned is there. It's already there. Nirvana is in samsara. It's already there. We don't need to go find nirvana somewhere else. It is the ground of all dhammas, all conditioned phenomena. Okay, so that's it for today. Unless there are any questions. I said I would leave some time. Maybe we can... Did you have a question? Sister Tandwan have a question? <laughs> Maybe we can listen to a sound of the bell. And
So, um, dear friends, for those of us online, I hope you feel a bit cooler, a bit more refreshed. <laughs> I, I know I do. It's, this is taking a, a bath in the Dhamma. <laughs> and it's very helpful to take a bath in the Dhamma. So we're um, just figuring out how to do this course online. And we hope to do it every Wednesday at 7.30 Pacific time. So um, the brothers are very generous to give their time to help put this online. And um, we'll, we'll try to look into ways that we can have it be somewhat interactive. So if there are questions for people watching online, um, maybe for now you can put it in the comments on YouTube. <laughs> And then we'll see if in the coming classes. Maybe we'll have a, a mailing list just for this course so people can keep in contact. And because I think it's very lovely to uh, have a group of us that follows through. Because <laughs> I'm also going into these teachings for my, my, my own practice. I really want to um, savor these, these 40 tenets. Uh, and so it's, it's nice uh, to do it together so we uh, have a continuous course. So uh, maybe next week we'll have more information about how you can keep um, connected to these classes. But for now, we'll just make a playlist on YouTube and we invite you, those of you who haven't seen the first class to watch it uh, when you have some time this week before the next class. Okay, thank you.